Okay, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about earthquakes and this is the final lecture of the first semester. Um, so this is the final uh, concept that we're going to cover before the semester exam. Over one million earthquakes may occur each year in the earth. Most earthquakes last only seconds, but some are large quakes that can last minutes. About 90% of all earthquakes are produced at plate boundaries where two plates are colliding, spreading apart, or sliding past each other. When these plates move suddenly, they release an incredible amount of energy that has changed into wave movement. 30,000 earthquakes worldwide annually that are strong enough to be felt, but typically only 75 of them are considered to be significant. Earthquakes occur in the rigid part of the Earth, the lithosphere, not the asthenosphere. An earthquake is a sudden vibration of the Earth produced by a rapid release of energy uh, or seismic waves which radiate in all directions from the source or focus. This energy can be built up and stored for many years and then released in seconds or minutes. Many earthquakes are so small that they cannot be felt by humans. Some, on the other hand, have caused great destruction and have killed hundreds or thousands of people. Like ripples from a dropping a stone in a pond, energy dissipates with distance. Earthquakes don't occur randomly, they occur at faults or fractures within the earth. Explained by plate tectonics, most earthquakes occur on the plate boundaries, sometimes in the plate interiors, if enough stress has been built up. The mechanisms for earthquakes was not known until, about the, uh, until after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. Scientists believe that the movement of the Earth's plates bends and squeezes the rocks at the edges of the plates. Sometimes this bending and squeezing puts great pressure on the rocks. Rocks are somewhat elastic. They can be bent without breaking. So basically, it's kind of like stretching a rubber band. You know, if you increase the tension too much, the rubber band will snap. Rock layers act somewhat in the same way. If the pressures become too great, the rock layer will break and move. When this occurs, the layers will move along a crack in the Earth's crust called a fault, or the release of the energy will cause a new fault line to be reproduced. This rupture of the rocks and resulting movement causes an earthquake. So a lot of uh, what they call this now is called the elastic rebound theory, which means that forces bend rock on either side of a fault. The rock strains ever so slowly, and then the weakest point breaks. Breaks send out shock waves, which migrate outward from the original break, causing shaking, and stress is released. Aftershocks are adjustments to that change in stress, and they are always less strong than the main shock, but they may cause more damage to already weakened structures. The elastic rebound means that the Earth is an elastic body, which can be strained during the plate tectonic processes, in particular fault zones at the boundaries of large lithospheric plates which lock despite the motion of the plates. And over time, large strains can accumulate in rocks next to the fault zone. Finally, the stresses become so large at the, accumulate, at the locked fault zones that they rupture and slip. And this rapid slippage releases in the strain energy, which was accumulated over a long period of time in a process called elastic rebound. Earthquakes can also be caused by the movement of magma toward the surface or by human factors such as pumping fluid underground. When an earthquake occurs, an area of the crust will move very suddenly and with a great release of energy. This point of the actual rock rupture is called the focus. The focus is usually found far beneath the surface and the point directly above the focus on the surface of the earth is called the epicenter. When the rocks move suddenly, they will produce waves in the Earth's crust, and these waves move out in all directions and can produce widespread damage on the Earth's surface. You'll see that effect as scarp, which is a surface break or rupture of fault that the earthquake has occurred on. Again, you will see more than 90% of all earthquakes occurring at plate boundaries, as shown by the map on this slide. The actual shaking produced by earthquakes is usually quite short, but the duration of shaking varies. In the 1960 San Francisco quake, it was 40 seconds. The 1989 Loma Prieta quake was 15 seconds. And the 1962 Alaska quake, which this is a part of a picture of, lasted for four entire minutes. 
Remember that earthquake waves are called seismic waves, which are recorded on seismometers or seismographs. Seismic waves are important for two things. One, locating the earthquakes, and we know how to do this using PNS time travel curves describing the Earth's interior. Earthquake waves resemble sound and water waves in the manner in which they move. It is these waves that roll through the Earth's crust that cause buildings to collapse, bridges to snap, mountains to rise, the ground to fall, and in some cases the ground to open up into huge cracks. The seismic waves spread out in all directions from the focus. There are ty two types of waves, surface waves and compression waves. Surface waves travel on the Earth's surface away from the epicenter. These are waves that have produced the most destruction and they origina originate from the arrival of PNS waves at the surface. They are much slower than both PNS waves. Surface waves are limited to travel only along the surface of the Earth, just as the waves in the body of a water are limited to traveling only along the surface of the water. There are two types of surface waves, love waves and Rayleigh waves. Love waves move in a manner very similar to S waves, but the movement to objects in its path is side to side instead of up and down. Rayleigh waves travel in much the same way as waves in water. Rayleigh waves have an almost circular pattern to its wave motion. Body or compression waves travel through the Earth's interior and spread outward from the focus, not the epicenter. They have two types, the P waves and the S waves. P waves are the fastest of the seismic waves. They travel at incredible speeds, over 14,000 miles per hour at the surface and over 25,000 miles per hour through the core of the Earth. P waves are even able to pass all the way through the entire Earth. They are the first to arrive at the surface of, an Earth, uh, of the Earth where the recording stations are located. Because of this, they're given another name, P or primary waves, which means they hit it first. When a P wave strikes an object, they push and pull the object, like a train engine bumping into a railroad car, which then bumps into another, and so on, all the way through the whole length of the train. This jackhammer movement is the first sign that an earthquake is occurring. As a wave passes through a house, the house is pushed and pulled. If the house is not strong enough, it will collapse. S waves are also known as shear waves. They reach the surface shortly after the P waves and are also given the name secondary waves. S waves travel at about half the speed of P waves. They move objects in their path in an up and down motion in the direction that the wave is moving. S waves can move only through solids and because of this can travel only through the crust and mantle of the earth. When S waves strike the outer core, which is made of liquid, iron, and nickel, the waves will stop. Because of this, we know the structure of the earth's interior. To figure this out, seismologists have used the following information. P waves travel faster through dense rock and slower through less dense rock. S waves don't travel through liquid. And some P and S travel times cannot be explained by distance from the earthquake alone. So you get a shadow zone because the S waves bounce off that liquid core. Um, and so you don't have uh, any S waves showing up there. The magnitude is a measure of the strength of the seismic waves that have been sent out from the focus. The Mercalli intensity scale is based on the damage done by the earthquake in a particular location. It is rated from 1 to 12, and it is subjective because damage can, done can depend on a lot of things besides the earthquake's size, such as the distance from the earthquake, poor construction, and the kind of rock in the area hit by the quake. So we typically don't talk about Mercalli magnitude except in an anecdotal sense. Typically, though, we talk about Richter magnitude, which is a number that is used to measure the size of an earthquake. A scientist will use a seismograph to determine the strength of the quake. The seismograph is an instrument that measures the amount of ground motion that an earthquake produces. The Richter scale is based on measuring the amplitude or size of the largest wave recorded on the seismogram. Scale ranges from M0 to M8.6, and it is logarithmic, which means that an increase on the scale means an amplitude of ground motion is 10 times greater. 
A magnitude 6 quake has a 100 times larger ground motion than a magnitude 4 quake increase of 1 on the scale is a 30 times increase of energy. So a magnitude 6 quake has 900 times more energy released than a magnitude 4 quake. The waves from an earthquake sets a writing device in motion showing the magnitude and the length of time that the earth is in motion during that quake. The strength or magnitude is recorded as a vertical up and down lines, and the stronger the quake, the longer the lines will be drawn on the graph. This is an example of an ancient Chinese seismograph. You can see that the dragons are holding a ball um, in their mouth, and the ball is very delicately balanced, so that if even the sliding sh slightest shaking occurs, the ball will drop out of the mouth of the dragon. And you can see that it's in multiple um, directions, which means that the one that is opposite the direction of the earthquake waves will drop its ball into the frog's mouth. And that's how the Chinese could tell when the earthquakes had occurred and also um, what direction it came from. To locate an epicenter of an earthquake, you use a couple of different things. You look at the arrival time of the PNS waves, because the farther you are from the earthquake, the longer it takes for the earthquake waves to reach you. There's travel time car curves, because the farther you are, the bigger the difference between the P arrival and the S arrival. And you need three stations to locate the epicenter, because the epicenter is going to lie at the intersection of the three circles with a radius equal to the distance defined by the PNS time. Earthquake belts um, happen in convergent margins. Uh, the big ones happen in the convergence, and the small ones happen in the divergent uh, margins. There are two major regions of earthquake activity. And one is the circumpacific belt, which encircles the Pacific Ocean, and the other is the alpide belt, which slices through Europe and Asia. Um, and the Circumpacific Belt includes the west coast of North America and South America, Japan, and the Philippines. And so that's where the really big ones hit. Earthquakes are the most destructive forces on Earth, but it is the buildings and other human structures that cause injury or death, not the earthquake itself, typically. Each year, many people are killed during the collapse of buildings caused by the shaking associated with earthquakes. The worst earthquake in 20th century occurred in Tangshan, China, in July 28, 1976, at 3:42 a.m. One of the million inha of the million inhabitants asleep in the city, 240,000 people lost their lives in buildings that collapsed. The buildings were made of re unreinforced brick walls, and they could not stand the shaking associated with large earthquakes. When the walls collapsed, the roofs caved in, and the sleeping inhabitants were crushed. In the U.S., the 1906 San Francisco earthquake is the most famous for its death toll. Some other examples of large quakes and damage. In 1988, there was one in Soviet Armenia. It was a magnitude 6.9, and 25,000 people died. 1985, Mexico City, a magnitude 8.1, 9,500 people died. The 1989 Loma Prieta quake in California had a magnitude of 7.1 and 40 people died. Mostly in this picture down in the lower section, a bridge collapsed and it was a double-decker bridge and it dropped on people driving. And in 1995 in Kobe, Japan, there was a magnitude 7 quake and about 6,000 people died, mostly in high-rise office buildings. Ground rupture results directly from the movement of the surface waves whose energy exceeds the ability of the ground structures to bend. So remember, those are typically Rayleigh waves and love waves. Damage due to ground motion will depend on the amplitude, duration of the vibrations, nature of the material the building is built on, and the design of the structure itself. Liquefaction is... Um, a common occurrence in certain types of ground areas during an earthquake. Stable soil will begin to act like a fluid due to the shaking and it no longer supports the buildings and it drops. And some examples of that are Mexico City and Loma Prieta. 
Other types of damage that can occur due to earthquakes are fires, landslides, and tsunamis. Fires were a major source of death in the San Francisco 1906 and 1989 quakes, as well as the Turkey 1999 quakes. Tsunamis are tidal or harbor waves, which caused by vertical displacement at the seafloor due to an earthquake, and it causes a giant ripple in the ocean. Okay, so that's all the death and destruction I have for you today. Um, this is definitely something that you will probably want to look into a little bit more carefully. Make sure that you understand the difference between the different kinds of waves because that's important and also how we determine the epicenter and focus. All right, well, if you have any questions, by all means, please come and see me during office hours or send me an email. Have a great day.